Ernie, are you okay? Ernie. Ernie. Oh, so that's what happened to Ernie. He got married to this blender, but the people of Angel Grove just didn't understand, so he moved away. Explains everything. Welcome, my friends, to Power Rangers Zeo. Go, go, Power Rangers! It's very easy to take for granted nowadays the change over to Zeo. At the time of this recording, it's been over 20 years since Mighty Morphin Power Rangers ended, and since then, for the most part, the brand of Power Rangers has shifted its theme, cast, and setting every year, renaming it along the way. But back in 1996, no kid could have imagined anything like that. It was just Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Hell, as far as general pop culture knowledge is concerned, there isn't anything but Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. That silly show with dinosaur robots and guys in spandex diamond suits battling Rita Rapunzel Pulsa and blah blah blah. I know I keep bringing that up, but that's only because that's the nature of pop culture. With very few exceptions, something doesn't retain the same level of popularity for a very long time. Or if it does, it's only the basest elements of it that stick in people's minds because they're not dedicated fans of it. For example, most people with pop culture knowledge know who Darth Vader is. However, there are considerably less people who know who Asajj Ventress is. By that same token, most people know who Captain Kirk is, but considerably less no Captain Archer. Both of these examples are from franchises that have lasted a very long time, but pop culture osmosis means that some things will endure longer in people's minds than other things, because the franchise changes and devolves while the audience grows smaller with those changes. And I don't say all this because of some nerd fandom's gatekeeping or the like, that someone isn't a real fan just because they don't know the name of every student at Hogwarts or something. People can like something even if they're not well versed in it. The goal should not be to exclude people but to encourage them to learn more. But no, the point I'm bringing up with this is that changing the franchise name and look for the first time was a risky thing to do. It can cause confusion for people, a reinvention can go in a direction that the viewers may not be interested in, or the overall new aesthetic can just be undesirable. As I've pointed out, it's likely that fear of such a massive change is what kept the series Mighty Morphin for 150 plus episodes and in the same suits. But when it comes to little kids, such a massive change isn't on their minds as much as, when the hell are we gonna see resolution? Fortunately, kids didn't have to wait long. Mighty Morphin concluded in February of 1996, and Power Rangers Zeo premiered only two months later. During this time in the franchise, a prologue would show at the beginning of all episodes, a today on Power Rangers kind of thing, with the exception of multi-parters where it would be last time on Power Rangers. During the reruns between the end of season three and the beginning of Zeo, these segments were replaced. To both build hype and assist in the transition, a 32-part serial filled in the spots. It's non-canon because the timeline of events shown doesn't match what happens at the actual beginning of the season, but it did its job of building hype. Brief segments showing that something was arriving on Earth, scaring scientists, the government, Rita and Zed, and of course our heroes, Bulk and Skull. Most notable in the shorts, however, is the fact that the Power Rangers seem to be missing. So. Last time on Power Rangers! Ay, 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 ay. Alpha, what's wrong? Goldar and Rito have stolen the Zeo Crystal! <laughs> what's happening? Rangers, you must evacuate the command center! We can't leave you! Eh, nothing that important happened. Anyway, after a recap of the events of the season finale, the Rangers go through the wreckage of the command center, hoping to find any sign of Alpha or Zordon. Up on the moon, Zed and Rita are deep in celebration of utterly defeating the Rangers, at least until the palace starts to shake. Rita looks through her telescope to try to figure out what's going on, and is horrified by what she sees. Back in the ruins, Adam spots something glowing amidst the rubble, and the Rangers start digging. Five minutes later, they're still digging, despite the amount of rubble they must have cleared away by that point. They discover the Zeo Crystal, figuring that Goldar must have dropped it. 
I have no idea how the hell one does that when you're teleporting, but I'm gonna guess based on what we see of Goldar and Rito later that the command center's usual defenses for keeping evil forces out screwed them up and, coupled with the bomb they planted, forced the Zeo crystal from their grasp. Up on the moon, the palace is under attack. Rita and Zed quickly decide that they have to flee from someone named King Mondo and his machine empire. We get our first glimpses of that empire, and it's damn impressive. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of mechanized servants, walking tanks, aircraft. Mind you, Mondo will resort to the exact same damn strategy that Rita and Zed pulled during their tenure instead of launching a full-scale invasion, but hey, what are you gonna do? We'll get a big invasion from space later, trust me. Anyway, Zed and Rita carry off all their possessions towards Serpentera, along with the Tangas, Though why they didn't whip up some putties to help carry the stuff is anyone's guess. Rita realizes that they forgot Rito and Goldar, but Zed tells her to forget about them, since they obviously failed to obtain the Zeo Crystal. Speaking of which, the crystal causes the Rangers' feet to stay gripped to one spot and a hole opens up, dropping them into the tunnels under the command center. Zed realizes the important fact that while they may eventually escape from the Machine Empire, they have nowhere to escape to, especially since Serpentera's AAA batteries are no doubt going to end up dying if they just wander around too long. Rita suggests that they go to the M51 galaxy and live with her dad. While Zed is reluctant to do so, he really has no better ideas and they proceed to Serpentera. As the Rangers explore the tunnels, the outer shell of the command center miraculously starts to reassemble itself. In town, Rito and Goldar find themselves scrounging around a neighborhood, suffering from amnesia. Eventually, they run into Bulk and Skull, who are assembling a motorcycle to make their own patrol bike. At first, they're frightened by the two, but when the monsters reveal that they're desperate for help, Bulk and Skull take them in as their servants. I'll get into my thoughts on that at the end, of course. The Rangers eventually come across an energy door and enter it, hearing Alpha's voice on the other side. They emerge in a high-tech room, where Alpha explains that this is the Power Chamber, a secondary command center that Zordon and he have been working on for a while. Zordon exposits about the Machine Empire arriving, about how they've broken away from the United Alliance of Evil and now need to conquer the Earth to complete their strategy of taking over the universe. Speaking of the Alliance, Zed and company finally manage to escape, but Zed swears that he'll return. The Rangers are told that with the Zeo Crystal, they can now give them new powers to fight the Machine Empire. However, Billy points out that there are only five Zeo subcrystals, and thus only five of them can become Rangers. Billy says he's willing to step down, though Tanya does try to intercede since she's the least experienced. However, Billy thinks that his time with the Alien Rangers showed him that he could be of more help to the team as a technical advisor and helper at the Power Chamber. We learn more about the Machine Empire and the Royal House of Gadgetry. King Mondo, of course, his wife Machina, his son Prince Sprocket, and footmen of the throne Clank and Orbis. Clank has a Scottish accent because the Scottish are well known for colonizing other worlds and building robots. The foot soldiers of the Empire are the Cogs, which, according to Zordon, must be completely dismantled to be defeated. Turns out that fully dismantled means punch them enough times and they'll either die or run away. The Zeo subcrystals are reconstituted into the new morphers, called Zeonizers. The Zeonizers are awesome. They're different from the morphers while still maintaining their unique look and coolness factor, especially since it takes them getting used to on how to open the damn things, speaking from experience here. Meaning that you need to be kinda skilled to get it right. The Rangers are also granted new colors along with the powers. While of course Cat is pink and Tanya is yellow, Rocky becomes blue, Adam green, and Tommy red. To add to the majesty of the new powers, there's a lot of really good background and incidental music that sadly I haven't been able to find in raw form. There's kind of a new chorus in the background, and it really feels like the whole thing is a new beginning, helped by a speech by Zordon about how the Rangers of old are gone forever, but that's fine since it's better than before. Of course, they also honor their past by putting up the old ranger costumes behind them, kind of like Batman. That's right, the power chamber is the Batcave. So the Zeo Rangers fight off the Cogs, with Tanya apparently trained in martial arts because she's more than capable of holding her own against them. As I've said in previous installments, trying to rock the boat too much in previous seasons would probably have created more problems than it solved for Mighty Morphin. However, as ratings were slipping, a radical reinvention of the show's trappings was probably for the best to get people interested in the new developments. A new base of operations, sort of, new costumes, new villains, a new character, and a reorganization of the colors and cast. And I think a Zeo beginning really helped to make it a creative success. 
If you're going to change all this, change even the name of the show to such a degree, you make an event out of it. The cliffhanger of the Command Center explosion, a two-part series premiere, and very little Sentai footage. It's especially effective in terms of pacing. Everything keeps moving at a good pace, setting up storylines even while it's putting old ones to bed for a while. Things don't outstay their welcome, and it's just really entertaining. Its only major weakness is its ending, which is rather anticlimactic. We have all this build-up to how badass and awesome King Mondo and his cogs are, yet the Rangers beat them in five minutes. However, everything else up to that point sets up the new status quo well, and there's a real sense of wonder and excitement once the Rangers get to the power chamber. Since this is the first time we have a major costume change, I should note that I like the Zeo suits. They're different from the Mighty Morphin suits in a good way, and I like the golden areas of the costume that are patterned like they were electronic circuits, which is something I'll get to when I analyze the themes of the season. While it's never really given a reason why the Zeo subcrystals have the different shapes to them, it does work for giving the Rangers something new for their helmets now that they don't have animals. Billy, who apparently decided to steal Steve Jobs' wardrobe now that he isn't a ranger, assists Zordon and Alpha in constructing the Zeozords, which are the only things that can stop the more advanced weapons of the Machine Empire like their fighters or tanks. And it's easy to see why. They just blast through them like flies. The Megazord's pretty cool too, kind of a sphinx head thing going for it. I think we can theorize that the Shogun Zords were used in the creation of the Zeozords, since otherwise they're able to assemble whole new giant weapons in a rather short amount of time. As for the Ninja Zords, we can probably assume they were destroyed along with the Power Coins, since if the Zords and Power Coins were linked for the original Mighty Morphin powers, Ninjor likely used a similar design for those. Speaking of, nobody mentions Ninjor, even though the whole time thing is over with. It's a shame, really. Ninjor had become as much a part of the show as any of the other supporting cast, and he really had no send-off. Hell, considering we get a similar kind of character to him later on, I'm surprised they didn't write him in as an altered form of Ninjor. There are a lot more filler episodes than the last season, which is both good and bad. While season 3 of Mighty Morphin had a strong storyline that kept the viewers enraptured, the less story-heavy Zeo allowed it to compliment people who missed the simpler single ones, while the actual storyline of the series kept viewers wanting to see how things developed. However, the story elements were pretty much built on continuation of the previous seasons, like with the development of Billy, who ends up with the most character growth this season. The start of that was, of course, him no longer being a ranger, but then, in Graduation Blues, he actually graduates early from high school and has to briefly go to Aquatar to assist them against some sort of water-polluting threat. He comes back a few episodes later, though his presence was missed. His absence does help contribute to the next part of the Zeo story arc, as well as something that we'll get to next time. The other one who gets development, if you can call it that, is Tommy. I say it's not necessarily development as much as it is stuff happens to him. The first thing we have to address with that is a three-parter. There's no business like snow business. It begins, after some footage of snowboarders, with Tommy receiving a letter from Kimberly. Now, of course, I'm always happy when the show acknowledges past characters, especially since the show will later go out of its way to pretend past seasons didn't exist, even though they still totally did. However, the manner by which they did this is... questionable. It's a Dear John letter. Yes, it seems Kimberly has found someone else while in Florida and is breaking up with Tommy. What. The. Hell. Now, I am not so dewy-eyed and such a hopeless romantic that I would believe that a high school relationship wouldn't eventually lead to two people separating, but the thing is that these aren't just teenagers we're talking about. We're talking about two people who served as basically soldiers in a war together for years and risked their lives for one another, who stood by each other even when things had gotten at their worst. Characters that the writers have spent a lot of time over the past few years investing us in their relationship. Chip. And she's breaking up with him off screen? What the hell, Power Rangers? I don't know, maybe that was the idea, that something like that happens in real life and is sudden, unexpected, and painful, but narratively, it just feels so unfulfilling. And the real point of this? The writers wanted to push a Catherine and Tommy relationship. Now, don't get me wrong, Catherine's a fine character, but why these two? There was quite a bit of fan backlash against this, especially since in the Christmas episode, yeah, Power Rangers has done Christmas episodes, and they're all pretty embarrassing, though the first one is the worst. There's a potential future scene where it looks like Catherine and Tommy are married and have a kid. Mind you, that future also shows a bunch of continuity hiccups that really don't work if you try to think about it too hard, so it's probably just non-canon, but still. 
I'm just saying, you could have easily made a relationship between Catherine and one of the other characters. Hell, Rocky and Adam don't do nearly as much as the others, and giving them a relationship would have been great character development. And the most it will truly amount to anything, besides for the occasional forced Catherine and Tommy moments, is character bits in the Turbo movie that don't go anywhere! The three-parter itself is stupid, too, and it seems like they did it purely to get a snowboarding vacation for the cast. The plot is paper-thin, with bringing Tommy up to the mountains on vacation to help him get over Kimberly, and Mondo keeps sending down monsters to try to take them down. Tommy meets a famous ski instructor there who seems to really be falling for him, except she's clearly supposed to be like 30 and he's still a teenager. Well, I mean, in the show. I don't think anyone in the casting department has ever seen a real teenager. This story also features snowboarding cogs, a monster that makes people fall in love with the first machine they see, and Tommy wearing this tuxedo, which doesn't at all make him look like a ventriloquist dummy. Anyway, as the filler continued, more toys for kids to buy, I mean weapons, were added to their arsenal. Like the Red Battle Zord, which has kick-ass rapid-fire punches and Gatling gun arms. Or stupid things, like the Defender Wheel, which was essentially a big hamster wheel that Tommy drives into things. The cool thing about the Red Battle Zord was that it was based on Aquatar Zords that Billy studied while he was there, which were directed by the Alien Rangers via psychic ability. So Tommy has to be in a state of peace in his mind. Which brings us to the next story element of the season. When I made the original Zeo overview in 2010, there was a storyline that I glossed over, which really I shouldn't be doing. I think I was just irritated by how it played on Native American stereotypes while not actually doing much to change Tommy's character. Couple that with the fact that, as I joked in a previous video, this can often become the Tommy Oliver show featuring the Power Rangers, and I wanted to glance over it. Still, whenever there is something that's major and life-changing for them, it should be acknowledged. During Tommy's Zeo quest, the native person who aided him gave him half of an arrowhead. In a storyline that surprisingly was not labeled as a multi-parter, beginning with Inner Spirit, Tommy encounters a Native American by the name of Sam Trueheart, played by the late Frank Salcedo, who was an actual Native American. American from the Wapo tribe, so kudos Power Rangers for not getting a white guy to do this, who looks exactly like the man who gave him the arrowhead. What I will not give the show credit for is that it of course plays on a lot of stereotypes, starting with Trueheart himself utilizing magical powers and giving vaguely poetic advice. At the end of Inner Spirit, we're introduced to David Trueheart, Sam's adopted son, who also possesses magic appearing out of nowhere Native American powers, leading into the next episode, Challenges. Sam sends Tommy on a vision quest, because again, this was the 90s where lots of various tribal beliefs were misappropriated and mixed into a hodgepodge of new agey kind of stuff, regardless of the actual details, to create this homogenous stereotype of Native Americans. And it's not really a vision quest as much as it is, follow Sam while he refuses to answer you and climb Vasquez rocks. The end result is finding David, who has the other half of the arrowhead. And what does that mean? David Trueheart is, in fact, Tommy's brother. Hell, he's actually played by Jason David Frank's real-life brother Eric, which helps the chemistry. Both Tommy and David were adopted separately, with David spending all of his life on a reservation. Now that I know that I have a brother, I'm never gonna lose contact with you again. Just like my good friend Richie. We learn also that the Arrowhead has very strong powers, and through a series of events involving Mondo kidnapping David to try to get the power of the Arrowhead, and I notice he doesn't use his magical Native American powers to escape like he had before, Tommy reveals himself as a Power Ranger to him, which helps lend credence to something in the next major storyline. Halfway through the season, Bulk, in an attempt to woo the police captain's daughter, accidentally gets Lieutenant Stone fired. Bulk and Skull, in turn, quit the force. However, Stone is more than happy to be gone, deciding to open up a detective agency like he always wanted, and hires the two to assist him. I admit I'm not sure why, because their ability to piss him off has been their shtick for this and the previous season, but hey, it advances the characters, keeping their shtick fresh in a new way. The next major story arc comes in The Power of Gold, wherein the Rangers detect two distress signals. The team is split up to hunt them both down, but it turns out that they're a trap set by Mondo. The cogs attack in force, overwhelming the Rangers. Billy tries to reach them when suddenly something jams the communications and overloads the power systems of Mondo's moon base. As a huge pyramid flies towards Earth and cloaks, Mondo withdraws his forces to prevent losing control over them. Oh great, now the Power Rangers have to deal with the Gaul. 
Back at the power chamber, Billy overlays the power signature of the Zeo subcrystals over the power signature of the pyramid, and it's an exact match, suggesting that there's another Zeo crystal aboard the pyramid. We never really learn why that is, especially given the history of the Zeo crystal we were given last season, but it's possible the citizens of M51 utilized the Zeo crystal before and kept a sixth part of it somewhere else. The Rangers worry that Mondo's new strategy may split them up even further, since there are only five of them. It used to be six. The Rangers head out to try to find the pyramid, but a group of cogs attack to distract them. While Billy stays behind with his tracking device, the Rangers get overwhelmed by the cogs and one of Mondo's monsters. However, the team is saved by the arrival of a new Ranger, the Gold Ranger. The Gold Ranger easily wipes the floor with the cogs. He's got a kick-ass golden power staff, moves like the Flash, and of course has his own theme song, much like the Green and White Ranger used to have. <laughs> After shrugging off the attacks by the cogs, he manages to dispatch the monster. However, Mondo is able to save it and make it grow. The rangers are forced out of their zords, but the gold ranger summons his own zord, Pyramidus. Pyramidus annihilates the monster, and the gold ranger vanishes before they can figure out who he is. When they return to the power chamber, Billy takes longer to come back. The mystery of the gold ranger was a pretty effective subplot. Most of the signs pointed to Billy being behind it, since he would frequently make himself scarce whenever the Gold Ranger appeared. He never gave an explanation for what he was doing, but while it was never revealed on screen what it was, there was one good theory that we'll get into next time. Another element that added credence to the Billy theory is that Pyramidus seemed designed to incorporate the other Zords to create the Zeo Ultra Zord. And given that Billy was the one who built the Zeo Zords, it'd make sense that he designed Pyramidus accordingly. So yeah, we'd never get an explanation for why it can incorporate them otherwise. Rocky's the first one to suspect Billy and confronts him, but Billy says that if he were the Gold Ranger, he'd have told them. In the penultimate chapter of the Gold Ranger mystery, Pyramidus lands on Earth. Mondo sends the cogs down in force to try to find it. The Rangers, in an uncharacteristic display of intelligence, decide to just watch the cogs and let them do the work of finding Pyramidus for them. However, before they can get very far, the cogs find them and attack. The Gold Ranger goes out to help and manages to defeat the cogs. When the Rangers finally try to ask him who he is, he's reluctant to talk. Before they can learn anything else, a bounty hunter named Verox attacks, attempting to steal the Gold Ranger's powers. Verox injures the Gold Ranger, who reveals that he can't tell them who he is, or else he'll lose his powers. I don't know why the hell this idea was introduced, since two episodes later we learn exactly who he is. It might have worked if they had gone the Billy is the Gold Ranger route, but this way it's just like they needed an excuse to just not have him tell them who he is. They teleport him to the power chamber, and he reveals that he knows who Zordon and Alpha are before retreating to Pyramidus. So what was the original plan for the Gold Ranger? Hard to say. I've had difficulty tracking down an official source for the most popular story, but it's a good one if it's true. At the same time Mighty Morphin Power Rangers was on, Saban was producing a similar style of tokusatsu show as it called VR Troopers. In fact, the pilot for VR Troopers, called Cybertron, featured Jason David Frank in the lead. When they ended VR Troopers, one of the actors for it, Brad Hawkins, was brought in to be the voice actor for the Gold Ranger and all the suit footage seen up to this point. Supposedly what happened was that the plan was to make VR Troopers take place in the same universe as Power Rangers, with Brad Hawkins' character Ryan Steele becoming the Gold Ranger. The rumor goes, however, that Shuki Levy changed that at the last second based off a casting decision he wanted to go with, and so the entire Ryan Steele connection was dropped before doing anything but hiring him for the post-production side of things. It certainly would have helped the clues provided, since what we actually get is... A bit nonsensical, but then again, this is the show that forgot Billy invented a flying car. The Gold Ranger's identity was finally revealed in Revelations of Gold. The episode opens with Pyramidus under attack by a fleet of Verox bounty hunters. Mondo plans to steal the Gold Ranger's powers while the Verox chase Pyramidus to Aquatar, where Pyramidus crashes and the Verox presume him dead. The Equations take the Gold Ranger under their care, and we finally get to see him without his suit on, and it's absolutely no one we know. Yes, all the hints and nudges were for nothing. His name is Trey of the planet Triforia. The Equations teleport him to Earth, but Mondo uses a force field around the power chamber so that when he arrives, he'll smash into it and be destroyed. They redirect the signal to a nearby sea and pull him out, but then he splits into three identical copies of himself. 
He explains that Triforians are made of three distinct personalities that are usually joined as one, but the battle has damaged him to the point where his three personalities have split off into Trey of Wisdom, Trey of Courage, and Trey of Heart. Yes, Trey of Heart, just in case you thought Captain Planet was the only one dumb enough to have that idea. Triforians are a race of peacekeepers who will sometimes venture out to other worlds to help stop evil, hence why he came to Earth to fight King Mondo. However, he's not certain how he can rejoin the three aspects back together, and in this state he's unable to become the Gold Ranger. They need to pass the powers on to someone else or else they'll be lost forever. What I love about this scene is that there isn't any hesitation, any question or wonder of who should assume his powers. Tommy instantly says he knows who can take them, and sends them to the power chamber to give the powers to Billy. However, when the Rangers return to the power chamber, they learn that during the command center's destruction, Billy absorbed a high dosage of negative proton whatsits, and essentially, he can't take on the powers. I'm not sure why it is from behind the scenes that they couldn't have Billy become the Gold Ranger, but like with the Brad Hawkins thing, there's a lot of speculation and rumor on why it didn't happen. But at least they acknowledge the possibility. Tommy leaves and tells everyone he thinks he knows someone else who can take on the power. While the rangers use the Zeo Crystals, along with the power of the command center, to keep the Golden Staff energized, Tommy retrieves his candidate, and they head back on foot to the power chamber. With the power diverted, they can't teleport him, and they can't track him out of fear that Mondo will figure out what they're doing. The implication, as Tommy and the candidate run back, is that it's David, which would make sense. They established that he knew martial arts when they introduced him, and he already knows all the rangers' identities. And anytime the rangers reveal themselves, it seems to almost be certain certain that those people will become Power Rangers. Kudos to the creators for doing an effective job of hiding his identity during the episode. As a little kid, my jaw dropped when they revealed him. Anyway, Mondo gets wise to the scheme and attacks the two, forcing them to run into their limited teleportation range. When they just barely get inside, Mondo initiates his new robot building technology process, using Neo-Plutonium armoring to enhance them. Why do I get the feeling it's gonna turn out to be glitter? Meanwhile, Rito and Goldar sleep at the detective agency. Goldar starts to remember who he is and gets a message from Rita and Zed. They'll restore their memories and even restore Goldar's wings, but they must swear off ever doing anything good. And they must prepare. Since they've left, we'd only seen them once before in a dream in the goofy but wonderful episode It Came From Angel Grove, and in the previous episode, wherein they had hired Bulk and Skull to figure out where they came from, only to discover a message from Rita and Zed that it was time for them to come home. But now, the message is clear. Rita and Zed are coming back. The two awaken with their memories restored and gleefully push aside Bulk and Skull, stealing their bike so they can get back to their Emperor and Empress. Tommy and the Candidate arrive, and the Candidate takes off his sunglasses. 